Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm gonna play this video and talk about things that are going on to better explain what's going on and talk about things that I think that are being done right and or done wrong. Here we go. Hello, I am Lieutenant Kevin Petrus with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. CMPD is publicly releasing body-worn camera videos today related to an officer-involved shooting that took place on September 15, 2022 in the 1300 block of Onyx Street. As we release the body-worn camera footage, the purpose of this video is to provide details, context, and analysis so that the viewers may have a better understanding of the event based on what we currently know. Please understand that this video contains violence and language that could be disturbing to some viewers. On Thursday, September 15th, 2022, at approximately 5.08 p.m., detectives in the CMPD Real-Time Crime Center located a stolen vehicle traveling on LaSalle Street in the Metro Division. The vehicle, a white Honda Accord, was reported stolen out of Charlotte just 12 days prior. Detectives began to track the moving vehicle using cameras in the area and communicated with officers about the vehicle's location. When the vehicle was stopped at a traffic light, detectives were able to see that the driver had a firearm on his lap. Specifically, they were able to ascertain that the firearm was a Glock-style handgun with an extended magazine. They relayed this information to responding officers. Uh, White Honda Accord, Tom Adam Edward, 4966, straight 87, I've got eyes on it right now, base cordless style. The front end looks to be damaged. Um, with a missing front bumper. It's going to be turning left when it hits the light, uh, going southbound Beatty's Ford. Occupied two times at least. Front passenger, oh, we got a 94 with an extended clip. 94 extended clip. Officers located the stolen vehicle and activated their blue lights and siren. Officers were operating marked CMPD police vehicles and were wearing full CMPD police uniforms. When the stolen vehicle stopped at the intersection of Dundee Street and Onyx Street, the driver of the vehicle immediately fled from the vehicle on foot while holding a firearm in his right hand. Two officers chased the driver on foot from the location of the stolen vehicle to the rear of a house on Onyx Street. Two additional officers parked their police vehicles near Onyx Street and Celia Avenue and began to move towards the area that the driver was running. There were four subjects in the car and four total firearms were located during this incident. During the time in which these four officers were pursuing the driver of the stolen vehicle on foot, three of the officers perceived an imminent lethal threat and fired their weapons. The suspect was not struck by the gunfire and was not injured. We will now show the footage from the involved officers. First is the body-worn camera footage from Officer Blow. Okay, so since this video that they released is 20 minutes long, um, I'll do this in segments. So let's talk about what we've already seen so far. Um, they've got this real-time crime center, and that's a pretty cool thing um, that allows them to have people to monitor their monitor these cameras, you know, across their town and be able to see things that are going on, be proactive, get officers in or out to a certain location. Uh, you know, if a, a, a citizen calls in the dispatch to report something and they can, uh, like a reckless driver or something like that, they can utilize these cameras to, to follow that car and uh, keep live updates on exactly where it's at while units are responding to get to that location and they know exactly where it went. Uh, and of course, you know, if they need to record uh, footage, you know, I'm sure they have that ability to do that and that's, you know, better evidence for them to have, etc. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it is a money thing. So only agencies that have, you know, larger budgets can afford to do stuff like that or they can get it um, maybe on grants and things like that. Um, here locally, our uh, campus police at, uh, at the university, uh, they have a camera system on campus that their dispatchers can access and pan, tilt, zoom in, and look around and see what's going on on campus, 
and be able to uh, let the officers know about things that are going on. Uh, if the officers are out somewhere on campus, you know, the dispatcher can kind of zoom in and, and see what's going on. Uh, if they need to go back to look at cameras to see, you know, someone's um, gone in a certain area, they can do that. I know last week um, there was a guy who bailed out on foot um, across the tracks from uh, the campus and they had uh, contacted campus to see if um, they could look at the cameras to see if that guy had come out of the wood line and went anywhere on the campus or anything like that and they was able to to look back and see that you know he didn't come out so that kind of helped them narrow down their search area and etc so pretty cool uh, ability but unfortunately not many places can afford it I do like that type of model uh, now I don't know how this is set up. I don't know if like they're in the dispatch center with the dispatchers or if they're like in the same building, but a different floor. Like I have no idea how that's set up, but I think a good setup would be something similar to what's called a fusion center. Um, we have a large room, almost like a, like what you would see in a movie, like a big command room going on, big screens and everything set up and, you know, multiple workstations, etc. Um, having your dispatchers, uh, and people who are assigned to work the cameras in the same room, being able to communicate with each other and update live things. The camera person having the ability to broadcast on the net uh, and give live updates right then and there versus trying to type it into the CAD system and then the dispatcher, you know, having to read that and then broadcast it, whatever. Uh, that's really cool because that's instantaneous live feed right there, live updates on what's going on. Of course, dummy here no, riding around with a gun in his lap. They relayed this information to uh, his one. That's not the, the brightest thing to be doing, um, riding around with a gun in your lap uh, like that. If you were to come to a sudden stop, that gun would go flying out and hit the floorboard, and you wouldn't be able to easily access it. Um, of course, when it comes to guns and cars, the best way to carry a gun in the car is in a holster on you, like you normally do when you get out of the car. Uh, how you walk around with your gun is the same way that you have your gun when you're in the car. Uh, you can tuck your shirt in behind the gun once you get in the car to be able to uh, have quicker access to it, etc. Uh, but there's no sense in riding around with the gun laying on your lap. or There's no sense in riding around with the gun uh, sitting in your uh, uh cup holder or laying on top of your uh, center console or on the seat or anything like that again if you were to come to a sudden stop be hit then your gun would become dislodged and you wouldn't be able to access it if you needed to but luckily um you know these dumbasses don't know all that stuff uh they don't look into you know tactics and skills and gear and stuff like that uh, they're they're kind of brain dead for the most part. Um, this looks like they. I don't. It looks like it's a. I'm gonna say it's it's a photoshopped image, but it's actually a a cropped image. It may be that they took this photograph of the gun on the ground, and then they cropped all this stuff to impose it on the video because this looks like grass and stuff right here from where it was laying on the ground. Um, it looks like they may have captured some of that grass when they were doing the uh, cropping and pasting of this image. Um, one of these little grip sleeves is on there. I don't believe in grip sleeves. I think they're kind of a, a goofy accessory. Um, these uh, slips or these grips can slip upwards and cover the, uh, the magazine ejection uh, button right there. I either impeding your ability to eject the magazine or causing your magazine to be prematurely ejected um, <laughs> <pretty> <laughs> um, or it can slip down and uh, cover the opening there and impede your ability to insert magazine into the magazine well so no use for anything like this uh, the grips that come on these guns are just fine you know some people do some stippling I don't, I don't even think the stippling is 100% is needed. Uh, the newer Glocks that come with uh, the, um, the extra texturing on those, those are more than enough uh, grip. 
enhancements on there for you to get a good grip on that gun. You don't need all this extra bull crap on there. Here we are with their other guns. Um, this one right here, can't tell exactly what this gun is. It's hard to tell um, from where I'm sitting at and, and looking at stuff. Um, where are these guns coming from? So uh, there, there's other juveniles that are in the vehicle. Those juveniles are not going to the gun store and buying handguns. That's just not happening. So the most likely thing is that these guns are stolen or these may be guns that uh, their parents had in the house and they took them and uh, their parents were not uh, exercising good safety by keeping uh, their guns inaccessible or inoperable to unauthorized people. My bet is they're probably going to be stolen. Unfortunately, um, that's how a lot of guns end up on the streets. They end up getting stolen out of cars. People who go to work got bullshit law rules at work that they can't carry their gun in there, so they'll leave their gun in the car. And uh, car gets broken into, gun gets stolen, uh, or they leave their gun at home because they can't take it with them to work, and they leave it in the uh, nightstand or on top of the nightstand or somewhere that's easily accessible. Um, and the gun is left in an operable state so that anyone who picks it up can start using it. Um, if you're going to be leaving your gun at home, leaving your gun in the car because you got to follow some bullcrap rules at work about guns, um, you, you need to invest in a safe. You need to put your gun in a safe if you're not going to be carrying it. That way you can make it inaccessible uh, to unauthorized people. If you don't got that, uh, if you buy these guns new, they come with cable locks. So if you leave the house, uh, leave the car, then I suggest running the cable lock into it. And um, that way, if the gun does get stolen, it's at least uh, inoperable for the person who steals it. Yes, they can still get those things off, but it's not something they can immediately start using right then and there. They're going to have to put some time into getting those locks off. Um gun owners we are our worst owned enemies when it comes to this um when gun owners leave their guns in cars or at home and then they get stolen uh and then used on the streets those things end up being um used as statistics in uh gun violence statistics and those statistics are lobbied and used in um Legis legis legislative legislative committees and things like that and it's just basically ammo against us so we're supplying the ammo against us to the anti-gun crowd to take our rights away and as more as this stuff happens um the more the the, the ammo is piling up and the more it hurts us overall because they're going to eventually become successful in some fronts and being able to uh, trample all over our Second Amendment rights. This is the body-worn camera footage from Officer Blow. He was the initial officer to chase after the driver when he fled from the stolen vehicle. Hands up! Hands up! Put the gun down! Put the gun down now! Put the gun down! Put the gun down now! Hey! Hands down. And we're at Sealy and Onyx. Everyone's 10 4. Just hold the channel. Hey, stop moving. Stop moving. Dude, keep your hands back here. Are you good? You get hit? I'm good. Yeah. Hey, sit down. 
Here is the body-worn camera footage from officer. All right, so before we go any further, we'll review what we've seen so far. So he starts off, there's no audio uh, at the beginning. Uh, you know, they're, they're pursuing these people. When that started, that should have been the moment to activate the body camera. Because uh, you never know when this thing will come to a sudden stop and things will just rapidly occur. Um, you want that body camera on and recording in scenarios like this. That way, if it suddenly something happens, uh, your camera's already on and recording. You don't have to worry about trying to hit the record button or remembering to hit that record button. Um, if that means you end up recording several minutes of bullcrap, then so be it. You end up recording several minutes of bullcrap. I'd rather you record several minutes of bullcrap than to lose five seconds of valuable evidence that could help speed along your exoneration or to be the, the crucial thing that exonerates you. From Officer Blow. He was the initial officer to chase after the driver when he fled from the stolen vehicle. Hands up, hands up. And Blob almost got hit by this car coming in. When he fled from the stolen vehicle. Hands up, hands up. Boom. <laughs> I actually flinched a little bit when I first saw this. I was like, oh shit, he almost got creamed by this car coming in. Um... I get it, man. Like you're you're switched on. It's like, oh, the chase is on, but you got <laughs> you got to be aware of those surroundings. Uh, luckily, this driver was either stopping and slowing down as he was opening the door, um, and was able to apply enough pressure to come to a complete stop before hitting this officer. If not, had this car been going any little bit faster or anything. This officer could have been hit, and that would have been a bad day for him and the driver in that car. So some interest. Well, so some interesting uh, artwork, I guess you could say, outside this house. Put the gun down! Put the gun down now! Put the gun down! Put the gun down now! Hey. I just wanted to go to 480. <laughs> you can, you can just see the stupid in this guy's face. Hey. Hands out. He is someone who has not made a whole lot of smart decisions in the short life that he has been leading uh, i believe this guy is 18 or 19 years old um i'll, I'll do a little bit more of a rant later about some stuff like he's wearing a, a, a balaclava here the intentions of this is to cover your face so people can't make out your whole face but he's not even wearing it correctly <laughs> like even more proof that this guy is a raging idiot he's not going to make it far in his criminal career um, not the biggest fan of how he tried to take control of him and uh, take him into custody uh, as you can see this dude's able to squirm around little skinny uh ectomorphic body frame people are able to very easily do that they are able to squirm around really good <laughs> um i think what would have been a better option is to um he's already proned out but to go follow through the process for the felony prone out um 
have him stretch his arms out to the side, you know, palms facing up, have his turn his head away, not look, and then come in and uh, grab that arm, pull on it. That way you take him off any kind of balance he may have had uh, beforehand. Pull hard, turn that arm to a more vertical plane like a flagpole, come down with a knee uh, on each side of that arm. One's gonna be going to the back of his head, neck area, uh, and the other one's gonna be going to the back. And you have that one arm, boom, sitting straight up. He's not going anywhere after that point. Cuffs out already as you're making that approach. Speed cuff that one arm and then tell him to put that other arm behind his back so you can cuff it too. And if not, yank, uh, apply some pressure to that arm that you already have in a vertical uh, plane and a T-stance type of uh, hold and get compliance that way if not those other people there they're certainly going to be able to grab the other arm and get it behind his back um, anytime someone has one gun you must assume they have two guns so so just because he dropped that one gun doesn't mean he doesn't have another one on him you can see um that he is looking around and you'll see this in another body cam footage of him looking around and stuff but that is target glancing in my opinion. I think that he is looking around, trying to figure out where is he, where is he gonna go after this point. Um, I think that as he came over here in this corner and that officer opened fire on him, I think it scared the shit out of him um, and put him into freeze mode. Obviously he didn't fight, right? He had a gun, he could have shot back. So. He was not in fight mode at that point. He stopped. He was no longer flighting. He just kind of froze there. So he got so scared, he got froze. Um, and I think that was because of the gunfire directed at him. As he is now down on the ground, I think he is somewhat recovering from that, so to speak. And I think that he is looking around, trying to find an escape route. Where is he going to go at this point? But there's too many officers around, and he cannot make a good decision. He knows that if he tries to get up and go, or if he tries to, to do it really fast, there's going to be too many of them there to stop him. He's not going to get very far. But he is, he's working it. He's looking. He's, he's looking around, target glancing, seeing you know avenues of escape. But there's just too many of them there. If there were less officers there... I, I feel pretty confident he would have tried to jet. Hey, hands down. And we're at Sealy and Onyx. At one time. I mean, we're bringing it to that car. We're getting a car show up. We're going to grab you. Hey, stop moving. Stop moving. Dude, keep your hands back here. Are you good? You get So there's people in the background yelling at him, asking if he's okay. Uh, the way he's acting, he has a total disregard uh, for these officers. He's not even acting like they matter, like they're even there. He he seems kind of disconnected from them, and it's a behavior that. I've seen with a lot of younger people, um, I don't know any other words to explain it or, or anything, but you can just kind of tell that, um, like he has no regard for these people here. Hey, sit down. Patient of the stolen vehicle right. and was behind Officer Blow. And we're at Sealy and Onyx at once ten four. Just hold the channel. Hello, 
Bend your head. Stop. Bend your head. Please hold that. Keep your hand back. Are you good? Are you good? I still got two in the car. I'm doing all Next is the body worn camera. So not much from this guy other than the fact that he fired a couple rounds um, at the bad guy here. Um, I'll talk about handguns and rifles when we get to the other camera footage of the other officer who actually fired or who also fired. <laughs> Next is the body worn camera. Hey, drop the gun! 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 Hey, 13, 15, shots fired. We don't know if he's a suspect yet. Everyone check in a second. And I still got two in the car. I'm doing all this. Just press go ahead and this body worn camera. Hey, drop the gun! 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 This dude is so. He's so lucky. Um, very easily could have been ventilated, but uh, the officers are dealing with pistols. Uh, rifles are better than pistols. Uh, <coughs> pistols have short barrels, and there's only two points of contact on them. The littlest amount of movement interjected into a handgun can cause shot placement to go way off just the mere act of pulling the trigger of a handgun you can move that handgun so much that your round goes completely off from where you want it to and depending on distance and you know your skill and whatnot uh, you might not even hit the target at all and uh, <clears throat> some contributing factors into this is one one distance and you may think well it's not that far for a pistol, this is a, a, a decent distance here. Um, he's a moving target. The officer is running. Uh, came to not a full stop as he started shooting, but was coming to a stop as he's shooting. So you got two moving planes right there. Um, and you factor in the short barrel of the pistol and that he is firing his gun uh rapidly and under stress there may be some jerking in the trigger causing that gun to uh, move a little bit to the side as he's jerking the trigger if he is jerking the trigger which I think he, he may have been um, those can lead to misses and so when you look at gunfights uh, there's a lot of missed rounds in a gunfight if you watch enough of these videos you're gonna find out that the police do not always hit their target a hundred percent of the time some do, but it's not always. And there's a lot of missed rounds in, in gunfights, and I don't think people, you know, realize that. Um, this call that they're dealing with here, you know, they've got the broadcast that the person's got a, a gun, etc. Um, as they're en route to this call, you know, the passengers of the vehicles, if there's rifles in the cars, those passengers should have had rifles out and ready. Rifles are more accurate because they have longer barrels and there's more points of contact on them. They also have better terminal ballistics. Drop the gun! Drop the gun! 
It's coming from the direction of Celia Avenue. Drop it, guys! Drop it! We will now hear from Sergeant. Sounds like he fired maybe one or two rounds. Um, so it looks like three officers fired. This guy right here fired the most. That guy over there fired two. This guy, I think, maybe just one. From different angles, again, this guy's lucky he he didn't get ventilated. Um, don't know what's behind this tree line right here. Uh, there could be houses back there. This is an urban environment, so um, I don't know if we'll see this or not, but one thing that they need to be doing is after this sh shooting has occurred is people need to be checking in behind here. See what's back there, if there's homes, try to make contact, see if anyone's been injured, see where those bullets went. From Sergeant Stephen Winterhalter for analysis of this incident. Sergeant Winterhalter has been the Firearms Training Unit Supervisor at CMPD for over five years and is responsible for recruit and in-service firearms training. His previous experience includes being a member of the SWAT team, a sergeant over the violent criminal apprehension team, and a sergeant in the homicide unit. At this point where you're going to look at Officer Blobe's body-worn camera footage from this incident, we pick it up here. He is inside the patrol. I kind of like how they have a person who does kind of like a, a breakdown of what's going on here. Uh, that's pretty cool. I can't recall if I've seen this before from other agencies or not. Um, I feel like there was one I cannot remember off the top of my head. I think that might have been like a sheriff's office or something. Um, I, the other video that I've done from this agency, uh, they had the person doing the same thing. I think that's kind of a, a cool thing to do. That way, um, you know, when these videos are being released by them, the pub public can watch it and then they can hear someone talk about things that are going on to better explain what's going on. Um, that way people have a better understanding of what they're seeing and, and why things are happening. So looks like this probably goes on for the duration of uh, the video. And I will pause here and there when I come across things of interest to talk about and um, we'll go from there. Vehicle um, behind the suspect vehicle as the front right passenger. Officer Blow begins to exit the police vehicle as the car comes through a stop inside the, the middle of the roadway. Officer Blow immediately gets out of the vehicle and begins to pursue the driver of the suspect vehicle on foot and we can hear him relay to officers over the radio that he has observed a weapon um, is beginning to tell the driver to oh so that artwork on that wall jarred my memory um so i mentioned that earlier in the video um and then you could hear some people in the background kind of hooting and hollering and this guy was responding to the suspect was responding to them um it looks like this might be an area where you know he either lives or he hangs out uh it's his comfort zone i believe um i think he he chose that area specifically uh to go to during this pursuit because i think he's familiar with the area 
and I think he was feeling confident that if he got out and got out on foot, he would be able to lose the officers because he knew where, you know, knew where the cuts were and, you know, knew where he could jump a fence or go through, you know, an opening and, and try and lose people very quickly. Drop the weapon and continues to give verbal commands while on foot. Clearly, he sees the weapon, the presence of the weapon. He's relaying that to fellow officers and begins to give out a description of the suspect in terms of his clothing description. Um, we also observe on Officer Bloob's body worn camera footage as the suspect's running down Onyx Street, he potentially sees the presence of two marked patrol cars at the next intersection, which prompts the suspect to cut hard right into the yard of this house we see here and heads around the back of the residence. Oh. Officer Bloeb continues to give verbal commands to drop the weapon and pursues the suspect around the rear of the, of the residence. Oh. At this time, shots are fired towards the suspect by assisting officers who approached from the other direction. Officer Bloeb did not fire his service weapon um, during this incident, but it was the initial, the initial officers that fired were the ones at whom the suspect was running toward with the weapon. Once the suspect is determined to no longer be a threat, officers um, take him into custody and secure the scene. Um, to continue the investigation. So this is Officer Famulari's vantage point immediately upon turning the corner of the residence. Officer Bloeb is to his left moving towards the residence and the suspect is across the yard near the wood line. Officer Famulari has heard two weapons firing and as you can see here clearly there is no one else in the rear of the residence at this time. Assisting officers have yet to break cover from the far corner and are not in Officer Famulari's um, line of sight. It is at this time that he perceives the suspect as a threat based on the totality of the circumstances and the fact that there was just immediately gunfire prior to him turning the corner and he engages the suspect with two rounds. As he reassesses and sees that the suspect is no longer a threat at this point, he no longer fires any rounds, and he moves forward to help the assisting officers with taking the suspect into custody and securing the scene. In this next video, we are going to see Officer... So that was a pretty good point he brought up. That's something I should have talked about. Um, the fact that, you know, he comes around that corner. All he sees is his partner, the suspect. He just heard gunfire right before he turned that corner and doesn't see the other officers. Really good point that I should have brought up. Bar, who arrives on scene from the opposite side of the street from Celia Avenue and then um, engages in the foot pursuit. As soon as he exits his patrol vehicle, he begins to give verbal commands to the suspect to drop the weapon. Officer Barr has seen him running in his direction, first on the street and then around the back of the residence while in possession of a handgun. As the suspect runs in Officer Barr's direction, still in possession of the handgun, he perceives an imminent threat and engages the suspect with multiple rounds. The suspect does drop the weapon as he comes to a stop near the wood line, and Officer Barr fires no additional shots at that time. We can see the suspect's hands are up here, and they order him to the ground taking him into custody with assisting officers and then move back and help secure the scene. On this body warm camera footage, we will see Officer Wercheck arriving on scene from the Celia Avenue side of Onyx Street. As he arrives on scene, he exits his vehicle and the foot pursuit has already began. He'll follow the, the path of Officer Barr around the back of the residence and observes the suspect running in his direction, still armed with the handgun. Officer Wercheck and Officer Barr both engage the suspect until he drops his weapon and comes to a stop at the wood line. They'll keep the suspect covered with their handguns um, as assisting officers arrive on scene to help take the suspect into custody and secure the scene.
So as part of our analysis, it's important to look at what the officers knew at the time of, this, of the incident. We know that the vehicle that the suspect was traveling in was a stolen vehicle as described by Lieutenant Petrus um, and Real-Time Crime Center capturing it on the license plate reader. So the, the officers responding knew it was a stolen vehicle. They also had additional information that the subject inside the vehicle was in fact armed based on the camera footage captured inside the passenger compartment of the vehicle um, and the observance of the weapon itself. This information was relayed to responding officers who then were um, involved in the actual stop and foot pursuit of the suspect in this case. As the officers stopped the vehicle uh, there at the intersection on Onyx Street and began to pursue on foot, he was clearly observed to be armed based on the body-worn camera footage, the audio traffic on the camera as well as the radio, that they observed him clearly with a handgun while pursuing. So he was attempting to flee while armed into uh, the neighborhood and in the direction of assisting officers who had come from Celia Avenue. Why were the officers um, pursuing it? Well, they clearly had arrestable charges against this individual. <laughs> because they're the fucking police? I mean, that's, that's a good answer right there. Um, he was non-compliant with their verbal commands to drop the weapon and continued to pursue on foot while armed. The, the suspect had every opportunity to drop the weapon and in fact actually had the opportunity to leave the weapon in the vehicle um, even prior to attempting to flee on foot. This would have totally changed the nature of the incident if the suspect had just left the weapon behind um, rather than taking it with him while being pursued by uniformed officers. So it's reasonable to believe that the officers involved in this incident um, felt threatened by this individual who was armed with a handgun and running in their direction. So as we look at the eminent use of deadly force and the standard with which it's used in law enforcement and these type incidents, um, we have to consider what's called action versus reaction. Mm -hmm. And that's the ability of an officer to react to a suspect's actions who's armed with a weapon. It's documented and a known um, fact that reaction is going to be slower than somebody's um, intentional act to start with. And um, this is relevant in this case because the officers perceived an immediate threat did not have the luxury of delaying any longer than they had once they did perceive that threat he continued to run in their direction closing the gap between the two while armed they had they had to act in order to protect themselves or each other the officers did fire multiple rounds at the at the suspect none of which struck the suspect um, also led, which led to um, them continuing to fire until the threat was no longer present. This is consistent with their training. Officers here at CMPD are trained to engage the suspect until the threat is no longer present. Once the suspect dropped his weapon, then the officers ceased their fire and moved in to secure the suspect. The firearm that the driver was holding in his hand as he was running from the stolen vehicle was recovered at the shooting location. Three additional firearms were recovered inside the stolen vehicle. Responding officers took three other subjects into custody from the stolen vehicle. Two of those subjects were juveniles. Here are the videos of those interactions. Hands up! Don't you fucking move! Don't you fucking move! Hands up! Let's go! On the ground! On the ground! On the ground! On the ground! Hey. Hey, shots fired. Shots fired. Yeah. Officers involved. Head yeah. that way. What happened? Hey, what happened? Get out of the car, Phil. What happened? Hey, 
Hey, I need another unit to my car. We're getting a crowd showing up. Another, another, you know, another unit. Dundee and Onyx. Dundee and Onyx. Don't you move! Hey, I've still got two in the car. I'm kneeling on one. Hands out. Hands out! Two. There's two. Hands out, you back. Can you come get me, please, now? Man, me too aggressive. Can you please get me? I'm not doing that. Get over there! Yeah. Keep your hands up. Come on, get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Give me your hand. Give me your hand. Come out. Come out. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Hey. Two the driver of the stolen vehicle was identified as Shahid Covington. He was 18 years old at the time of this incident. He was charged with possession of a stolen vehicle and resisting a public officer. There were four subjects in the car and four total firearms were located during this incident. Two juveniles in the back seat of the stolen vehicle were also charged. One was charged with possession of a handgun by a minor. The other was charged with possession of a handgun by a minor and possession of stolen property. The CMPD homicide unit led the investigation of this incident. The district attorney's office has reviewed the shooting by officers and no criminal charges have been filed against the officers. CMPD internal affairs also conducted a parallel investigation and has concluded that the shooting was within CMPD policy. The officers who fired their weapons in this incident were justified in their actions in accordance with North Carolina General Statute 15A-401 D2, which states, a law enforcement officer is justified in using deadly physical force upon another person when it is or appears to be reasonably necessary to defend himself or a third person from what he reasonably believes to be the use or imminent use of deadly physical force. The full body-worn camera videos can be found at our website, www.cmpd.org, and I'm okay. the public officer. So, um, <clears throat> dude's 18. The passenger in the vehicle is obviously an adult. They didn't blur his face out. Uh, the other two in the back were juveniles. Um, I would not be surprised to find out if this dude has an extensive juvenile record and already has a record right after he's turned 18. Would not be the least bit surprised. You can see that 18 years old, he's already got the, the stupid neck tattoo thing going on, all the thuggery bullshit, um, in a stolen car, running around with a gun, like... This dude's future is is looking looking orange. <laughs> uh, he's gonna have a life behind bars. Uh, it, he's gonna he's gonna be one of those system people where he is in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out of jail and prison so many damn times. He might as well have his own room at the jail. Unfortunately, this is a, a common thing uh, within large municipalities, especially, you know, very large uh, Demo Democrat slash liberal ran uh, type of cities. I just can't seem to get a grasp on their thug problem. And a lot of that has to do with uh, how the, the judges and everything are in that town because they're elected and, you know, liberals elect other liberals. Um, same with prosecutors, things like that. And also, a lot of it has to boil down to, for people around this age, how the juvenile laws are set up. Uh, it's, 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 it's a sad state of affairs with the way juvenile laws are in, in many states. Uh, in Kentucky, it is a, it is a, a fucking clown show 
Um, the way the laws are written, you know, 16, 17-year-old gangbangers who are out there shooting each other up, once they're caught, they are basically being treated as if they were six years old. They get uh, nighttime snacks while they're in detention before they go to bed. They get snacks throughout the day. They get to get, have a PlayStation and plenty of rec time. And they can have uh, yoga, like someone from a detention center or one of the YDCs will be trained in doing a yoga class. Uh, if they're in a YDC, which a YDC is called a Youth Development Center, uh, if they're in one of those places, that's the equivalent of like a person, an adult being sentenced to a prison. If they go to one of those, they can go on outings. They get to leave the facility, go out into public, go to a, a, a buffet and eat food, go to a movie theater, go shopping. Like uh, it's it's they're called camp, and it's like a fucking summer camp for them. There really is no harsh punishment or anything like that. And the state doesn't believe in punishing juveniles. They believe in treatment. So the state believes that juveniles, uh, delinquent juveniles, are victims of trauma. And so they are to receive trauma-informed care. They believe that little monsters like this are victims instead of criminals. So... Um, when it comes to the juvenile stuff, it's really hard for the public to know about this stuff unless you are you know people who are in the system or anything like that because all the juvenile stuff is basically secret. You can't go into courtrooms that are, you know, handling juvenile cases. You can't look up juvenile records or anything. So the public never gets to see people like this who've been involved in the system multiple times literally being slapped on the wrist and nothing happening to them. Um, there does need to be some justice reform in this country, uh, both for juveniles and adults, but we really need some real true justice reform on juveniles to be able to make a clear cut distinction between, you know, the 16, 17, 15 year old gangbangers and the 10 year olds who go out and steal something from Walmart or, you know, something petty or whatever, because the way it is right now. The 16-year-old gangbanger who murders another gang member and is dealing drugs and burglarizing houses and robbing businesses and robbing people, when he gets caught, he gets treated just the same as the 10-year-old who went and shoplifted at a, at a store and stole candy bars. Totally unacceptable. It's not a great way to be doing things. Um, the 15, 16-year-old gangbangers out there living that life need be treated as adults. Now there is ways for courts to, to take juveniles and try them as adults, but that's 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 a process that takes place in a in a courtroom and until that point they're still in that system being treated like a little six and ten year old. They get to enjoy all those amenities. And then when they are finally convicted as a as an adult they stay within the juvenile system until they turn 18, and then they go to adult jail. So even after being convicted and, and treated as an adult, they still remain in the juvenile system, getting nighttime snacks, playing PlayStation, etc. That doesn't need to happen. That needs to change. Adult system needs some more accountability. Um, too many slaps on the wrist. We need to start getting hard on crime in this country. Uh, we have too many violent offenders and too many repeat offenders out there who are in and out, in and out, in and out, and they're victimizing more people, hurting more people, and killing more people, and it needs to stop. All right, not much else to talk about on this video. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you have not already, hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.